Thanks, Richard. It's a uh, privilege to be here in front of you today and to welcome all the people who have worked in the center and other around MIT back. Richard and Tyler have laid out the, the history and uh, the development of the center and the Koch Institute as it emerges. What I want to talk about for the next few moments is the building, the culture, and the symposium. This symposium stands at the transition between the Center for Cancer Research, shown at the left up there, and the new Koch Institute building. Science buildings are much like homes for family. They provide an environment for a culture for those who live within. In many cases, the culture is reflected in the style and the size of the building. However, this was not the case for the center, as we know. The center building, which we celebrate with this symposium, was converted from a candy factory, as you have heard, and it was opened in 74 on the eastern edge of the MIT campus. It was a small building, the center occupied only four floors, a rather limited space for 12 faculty. The statement of the exterior of the building, a plain brick edifice, as you see, with large windows, projected the image of a tentative new venture in cancer research, a venture at the forefront of new areas in cell and molecular biology, and at the time, it was a relatively foreign world to MIT. There was nothing bold about the center building. In fact, I'm not sure MIT had confidence enough in the future of this new venture to be bold. However, the understated exterior of the building was in stark contrast to the interior culture. There was a culture of collegial support, an adventure in a fascinating new area in cellular aspects of cancer research. The program was established, as you've heard, by Salvador Luria in the center in 1972 and was indeed a very bold venture. The center is literally the house that Luria built and had a wonderful culture. The vision, as you've heard, was to study the disease of cancer at the gene, cell, and immunological levels. Salva started this adventure by providing an environment where a small group of faculty, students, and fellows could interact to do significant science. We all knew that as long as Salva was in charge, important science would be recognized, supported, and celebrated. This was a culture of the center, and certainly of the fifth floor, which Dave Baltimore led, where Nancy Hopkins, Robert Weinberg, Dave Hausman, and myself started our careers. You see here Luria, David, and Nancy talking in a lab uh, as she was entering MIT. Let me talk about the building of cultures for a moment. I have been involved with Stand Up to Cancer over the past year and attended the meeting at the annual AACR meeting of Stand Up to Cancer. When I walked into the room, I saw a banner that caught my attention. The banner said, Culture Eats Strategies Lunch. The banner was made by Laura Siskin from Stand Up to Cancer. And as I thought about it, the truth of this statement is very obvious, but we keep forgetting it. If you get the culture correct in an organization, you will be able to execute on the strategy or change the strategy if it's incorrect. However, if the culture is not correct, then even a good strategy will probably not work. Here is the essence of Salva's leadership. He got the culture correct. A commitment to people, a commitment to significant science, and a commitment to take life seriously and work for an important objectives, as you have heard. Luria believed in specific individuals and in their greatness. He would not abandon an individual in support of an organization. 
I suspect that this commitment to individuals by Luria had its origins in his youth as he dealt with the political state of fascist Italy before the Second World War. He left that country to migrate to the US. That culture clearly was extended into the center, as we see here from multi-group pictures being taken as we pass our time sharing sci science in the Center for Cancer Research. Uh, Dave Baltimore and myself are over on the right. And uh, even graduate students got into the act. As Louis Parada here, as a student cleans the floor, I suspect right after he dumped radioactivity on it, but I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> This symposium, as I mentioned, is at the moment of transition between the house that Luria built, the center, to the house that Tyler Jacks and Robert Langer built, the new Koch Institute. With Tyler and others' leadership, I am sure that this culture will continue in the new home. The culture has to be expanded and blended, as we've heard, to include our engineering colleagues. In this regard, the Coke is very lucky. In many ways, the culture of the house that Luria built is the culture of MIT, and our engineering colleagues are already part of it. Let's look at the new Coke Institute. What does the architecture of this building tell us? This building is a bold structure, standing tall on Main Street towering over the Whitehead Institute <laughs> and the Broad Institute. This is not a tentative new adventure by MIT. It is a structure consistent with a strategy to lead a new and highly promising development in science and technology. I am confident that it will fulfill this promise, but we must wait 30 years to judge its success. Let us turn now to this special symposium at the transition between the Center Building and the Koch Institute. The symposium was organized with this transition in mind. The sessions span from topics typical of the Center to others that indicate some of the topics of the future Koch. We therefore consciously invited some speakers who trained or were faculty in the Center we made the decision early on not to invite anyone to speak who was currently a resident of the Koch Institute. Robert Langer, I mean Robert Weinberg, I got, I got my Roberts mixed up. <laughs> Robert Wein, uh, Bob Weinberg and Eric Lander are affiliate members of the Koch, but as you know, they're located in the Whitehead Institute in the Broad, and they will be part of the uh, symposium. We also invited outstanding scientists from around the world to be speakers. We seek their wisdom as we move into the center, move from the center to the new Koch Institute. And we thank them for accepting our invitation and look forward to their talks with great expectations. Here, I would like to emphasize to the speakers, particularly the speakers who trained and worked in the center, not to spend your precious time at this symposium doing any reminiscing. We love your friendship and stories. However, there will be ample time for this during the breaks and at other activities. Here in this hall, let's respect the science. Let's look, we look forward to listening to your fascinating science, and so let's talk about it in our presentations. In closing, I would want to acknowledge my colleague, Angelica, Amen for agreeing to help with organizing the symposium. It was a pleasure working with her. As you know, Angelica has made outstanding contributions to our understanding of the control of cell cycle, and more recently to the genetics and biology of aneuploidy. Angelica was trained by Kim Naismith, was a Whitehead Fellow, and has been a member of the Center and the Koch Institute for just over 10 years. She was recently elected to the National Academy of Science and has received many other honors, including the appointment as a Howard Hughes Medical Investigator. I now turn the podium over to Angelita to chair the first session. Thank you.